uh, you can't go to heaven and be racist. And uh, I was prepared for that to be my run out of town on the rail sermon. And uh, I kind of feel the same way about tonight. How many of you know that whatever you need answer to is in the word of God? Amen. The spirit of the Lord's here. The presence of the Lord's here. Amen. But I, I hope to be able, this, this sermon came. Uh, let me read my passage and then I'll let you know where this sermon came from. Luke 15, 1 through 3. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Let me just give you just a little quick message right here. Do you always see the publicans and the sinners are listening? The Pharisees and the scribes are talking. The Bible does say, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. That's in the book. We need to make sure we do some hearing, some listening, and some applying. And he spake this parable unto them, saying. I want to preach for a few minutes tonight. Won't be long. Won't be long. Probably not a good sermon to preach when I'm planning on y'all helping me do some work after church. Uh... <laughs> Maybe doing it by myself. No, I don't believe that. I want to preach you this message. When the hog pen is made safe. When the hog pen. Lord Jesus, I love you with all of my heart. I honor you. I praise you. I believe in you and I trust you. I don't want to lean to my own understanding, but I want to acknowledge you and trust you in all of my ways. I pray that you'll let me deliver this word tonight. Let me preach it like I feel it. Let me preach it as you've, if you've ministered to me throughout this service about this and for several weeks now about this. I pray the power of the Lord will manifest itself, but I pray more. I pray more than anything that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving our own selves tonight. Let me apply this to my life and going forward in my life and, and let these precious people that have been fighting needless battles apply it to their life. And I give you the praise for it in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. <clears throat> there are two messages that Jesus has given here. Though he's speaking the same words, one is to the publicans and the sinners, and the other to the Pharisees and the scribes. To the publicans and sinners, he is speaking of the seeking attribute of the Lord, which we know he manifested and, and expressed in himself to Zacchaeus when he said the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. And so the publicans and the sinners are receiving the message that the Lord is looking for you. The Lord is, oh God, help me preach tonight. Lord, have mercy. My God, have mercy. But the Pharisees and the scribes, he is speak of his receiving attribute, which is the Lord receiving those that are looking for him. Amen? Amen? There are those that the Lord goes seeking, that he's hunting for, but there are those that the Lord is waiting to receive them. First part of this parable, it is a sheep, one little lamb that is lost out of the flock, wandering, careless, with a disregard for safety, not necessarily from an obstinate heart, but from carelessness. The shepherd goes and searches until he finds the lost lamb. I would encourage you to please listen to me this morning. Whether this is applicable in your life or not tonight, it will be at some point. You can rest assured. The shepherd goes and searches until he finds the lost lamb. And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders, Brother Terry. And he's, the Bible says rejoicing. He then returns home and calls his friends to him to rejoice with him that his sheep was lost. But now, but now is found. Secondly, part of the story is that of the lost piece of silver, the lost money that was lost in the house. A woman has ten pieces of silver and she loses one. 
She lights a candle and sweeps the house diligently, hunting every nook and cranny in every corner for this one lost piece. And when it is found, the Bible says she calls her friends and her neighbors to her and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I have lost. Following both of these parables, the promise is given of a celebration that occurs in heaven every time one sinner repents, which is in fact the acknowledgement of the lost being found. Now we know you're not saved at repentance, but you cannot be saved without repentance. It is impossible. There are biblical instances of receiving the Holy Ghost and then being baptized and being baptized and then receiving the Holy Ghost. But there's no biblical incident, instance of salvation ever occurring before repentance. You must repent. The third illustration, and probably the most widely preached, is the story of what is commonly referred to as the prodigal son. Now you know I've often referred to it and even preached message as the prodigal son's. There was more than one that was wasteful. That's what that word prodigal means. Because it is evident that the son who stayed home was as wasteful as the one who left in many respects because he did not take advantage of the blessings of the house and the generosity of the father. What happened was, and you, and you many of you are familiar with it, for those that are not, a certain man had two sons. The younger son asked for his inheritance early. He said, I'm ready to go spread my wings. I, I want what's coming to me. This was not uncommon. It was not unheard of. It was not even altogether selfish by itself, Brother McKinney. If you study out the history, it did happen from time to time. But the Bible says he was given his inheritance. And he went and spent it all on riotous living until he had nothing left. And he began to be in want. That's the first step to true repentance. To somebody being brought out of their hell hole of a life uh, is to be in want. Everybody say in want. He went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country to take care of and to feed his hogs. Everybody say Jews don't like hogs. Oh, y'all don't really believe that, do you? It is despicable. It is unclean. It is to call a, a Jew a hog or for a Jew to eat pork or be made to eat pork is, is the highest of insults. The Jews were very strong in their belief of the uncleanliness of the swine or of the hogs. So in a manner of speaking, he had gone as low as he could go. He had nothing left but a measly little old job tending hogs. Luke 15 and 16 says, And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. I like the New King James Version rendering of this, especially for this passage tonight. 15 and 16 in the New King James Version says, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. This sermon is born from a conversation I had recently, a few weeks ago, talking to a friend of mine who's had trouble in his home. His daughter had gone away, walked away, gone her own path. But there was a family member not in his household, but a family member that felt sorry for him and began to hand out and hand out and bought him a car and paid for him to get an apartment and, and began to hand out and hauled him all over the country and, and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave. And I was talking to my friend and he was frustrated because as is usually happens, he had drawn a line and refused to go over it. And because he wouldn't, he was the bad guy. And family members were calling him in and saying, why don't you help her? Why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And he said, GL, I just don't know what to do. And immediately the Holy Ghost began to work among us. And he began to talk about how the prodigal wandered away from home. And then he got to the hog pen. And the Bible says he came to himself 
in the squalor, in the, in the quagmire, in the recognizing. Now I want you to understand the context of this scripture. Recognizing that the most despicable thing on the face of the earth as far as a Jew would go, which is a hog, had it better than he did. The Bible does not say that he ate the hog food. The Bible said he wanted to eat it. So the hogs had it better than he did. And immediately the Holy Ghost quickened to my mind because my buddy said he told this person, this family member, if you would have minded your own business, if you would have kept your pocketbook shut up, if you would have let her suffer and you would have let her struggle, she would have already been home. And if the Lord like quickened it to me and I said... She made the hog pen a safe place. And as soon as I said it, we said to one another at the same time, what did y'all used to tell me when we did that? Jinx, there you go. We said at the same time, I'm going to preach that. The hog pen was never meant to be safe. It is very important to receive this message tonight. The hog pen is supposed to be difficult. It is supposed to be humbling. There is supposed to be a time of awakening in the hog pen. Notice the scripture says, No one gave him anything. The problem in many of us receiving the change that we need is that the hog pen has been made safe. We see people, oh you hear me right now We see people that are in a mess And because we lack spiritual discernment We don't recognize that the only way they're going to come Have a come to themselves experience Is if the effects of the hog pen are felt But there are people that are living among us That the hog pen has become so safe They don't ever want to leave No one gave him anything y'all know I believe in helping people but there are many times we're getting in the way of the work of the Lord by making the mess of the hog pen feel safe and what we've come to now is we've got more than one generation who have married had children raised them and had grandchildren in the hog pen they never feel a desire to leave. Oh, they get a blessing and, and they have an experience with God. But they don't understand that the plan of God is never to stay where you are. He told, oh God, he told the lame man, take up your bed and walk. He told Lazarus, come out of the grave. He told the man at the pool of Bethesda, get your bed clothes up and leave. He told the ones that were sick to get up and leave where you are. God forbid that we... Don't you see the reason why that you're struggling, that you're depressed, that you can't make ends meet, that you're having problems? It's not only are you fighting hell, you're fighting the Lord. The Lord is trying to do a work in people's lives. And He can't do it because we've made that nasty place safe. I felt led by the Holy Ghost so strong for this. We have created a generation that does not have to be accountable for their decisions. Although the Father loved His Son, and we know that the Father, you listen to me right now, we know that the Father is a type of the Lord God Almighty. And the Father loved His Son. But we do not find one instance of the Father leaving the pleasures of the house, the safety of the house, the benefits of the house to go hunt that boy down. Oh, yeah, there are those that there are those that the Lord is searching for. The lost lamb, the little lost helpless lamb, the little piece of silver that's hid in the corner. But there are those that have wandered their own way. They have blazed their own trail and made their own path. They have found themselves where they are in a place of their own making. And because we feel so sorry for them. Because more because we're afraid of what other people will think. We go right to the hog pen with them. Pick up a shovel and scoop that slop on their plate. 
and make the hog pen a safe place. Oh, I've got three children, and I love them dearly. My wife tells me all the time, you're a pushover. And the truth is, I am. I am. That's why I pray this message speaks to me. I pray that it speaks to me. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and I'm proud of that. We live in a place where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are considered inalienable rights, and I believe in that. But it was a never a condition of the hog pen. The father devoted his life to keeping the house, not working on making the hog pen experience better. He didn't do any effort in making the hog pen experience better. He did nothing to make the prodigal's life easier. Because if he would have made it easy, I guess I'm about done. This, this went over just exactly about how I thought it would. There are people that are your way of life has become a hog pen existence. And I'm about to get in trouble right now, but I'm going to go there. You do not have to stay there. You want to know why so many of us are struggling spiritually? You want to know why many of us can't get to victory? It's because we're meddling around in something that's none of our business. The Lord is trying to teach people a lesson. The Lord is trying to drag people up up out of the mess uh, and let them have a come to themselves. You know what the greatest, uh, and I have this in my notes, but I'm on off the reservation a little bit right now. The most important phrase in this whole story, the Brother Risa, is when he came to himself. When he came to himself, you listen to me. If you keep funneling and keep funneling and keep funneling and keep funneling to the hog pen, they'll never come to themselves and it will begin to become normal and it'll become a way of life and their very existence will be because of somebody giving them something. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now I could just have a meltdown because I know I'm wading off. We battled it this morning. We battled it this morning. It's like, I think I preached about this, but I had another friend that they're having a healing line. They're having a healing line. I think I told this before, but it's still nuts. They had a healing line. And he come to one old boy and the old boy said, don't you pray for me. He said, why? He said, because the Lord might heal me and I'll lose my disability. That's the truth. I didn't make that up. That's a fact. That's what I'm just telling you. He said, don't pray for me. I don't want nothing to happen to mess up my check. God have mercy. I'm seeing, I'm dealing with people. Lord have mercy, Brother Rice. If y'all better be glad that I, I sometimes say things I shouldn't. I do. But y'all better be glad I can be discretionary. Because I'm, the, the, this message is birthed, uh, Brother Rice, and something that I'm faced with every day, trying to help people, trying to come with a solution. And most folks, you hear me right now, most people have thrown their hands up and said it's a lost cause. Can I tell you, can I just be honest with you? That's run through my mind. That's run through my mind. Maybe we need to just cut our losses and move on. But that's not the God I serve, Brother Manny. That's not the God I serve. Mar Mary and, oh, Mary and Martha said, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He was sick, but you could have healed him, but now he's dead. What we do is we take matters into our own hands and we put limits on where we'll trust God. We put, and we try to play God in people's lives. We, and, and you wonder why folks are standing around all the time. It's because we've, took on, we've put ourselves on the throne of their lives and decided we know better than God does. I want you to, you to please don't you misunderstand me. Don't you misunderstand me for one second. What you have done is you have removed their ability to look to the Lord for help. 
and they put their faith in you. And what's going to happen is you're going to fail them. And when you're gone, all they know is the hog pen. We have got to get something. Now, this is not popular. This is not easy. I'm already thinking I've done made this one mad. I made this one mad. I made this one mad. I made this one mad. But uh, you know I check the congregation out before I preach. And see if there's anybody that can whoop me. You got to understand something. There's an answer. Brother McKinney, there's an answer. There's an answer. God. We're talking about life change. You listen to me. They took that old boy to the, to the gate. Beautiful every day. You want to know why? He didn't have any other options. Except to believe in the benefits of church folks. Helping him, helping him, helping him. But Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. That's all I'm trying to do tonight. There's some of you folks in here. I don't want to embarrass you. But there's some of you folks in here. I'm so stinking proud of you. You're scratching and you're clawing and you're doing everything. Let me tell you something. Hold on. Hold on. Just a little bit longer. Because the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen. You be faithful. You be faithful over a few things. He said, I will make you ruler over many things. Don't you think I'm beating you up today? I'm not. But I'm, what I'm telling you is there's a better way to live. There's a better life for you. There's a better witness for you. And when you come out of it, like Job said, uh, when I'm tried, I shall come forth as gold. Purified. But we have the purification process. You know what? I, I want to help people. Please forgive me if I, if I, no, I'm not, because I prayed before service. Lord, don't let me get an ugly spirit. Let me let people know I love them. But let me tell you something. We're interested in people that are hungry for God. Not hungry for a few dollars in their pocketbook this week. I'm not being ugly. And I don't want to embarrass Sister Leanne, but what happens if you keep believing? The Lord comes through for you, don't he? Don't the Lord come through for you? If you just keep on believing. I remember your request when Brother Norman was here. And the Lord's answered that request. The Lord's going to make a way for you. He's going to make a way for you. You just got to believe in him. He's going to make a way. But please understand, if I let you stay where you're at, it ain't because I don't love you. But it's because you're going to have to come to the realization that things are better at the Father's house. And if I keep currying your favor in the hog pen, you don't never want to leave. Oh, man, I'm about nervous as you know what in church right now. Kenny told me, I'm going to bust you out, brother, right here in front of everybody. Brother McKinney told me when y'all elected me to be your pastor. He said, I'd a lot rather pastored in my day than in yours. You remember telling me that, Brother McKinney? There's so much junk we got to battle with. There's so many attitudes and spirits we got to battle with. And you know something, Brother Eugene? My greatest fear, my greatest fear is that I won't have the courage to speak the truth when it's unpopular. But instead, we find ourselves, and you hear me right now, and I'm about to close, but I will tell you that I've not said one word out of line with the order of the Holy Ghost. But the definition of insanity 
is doing the same thing over and over and over and over, expecting different results. There's got to come a time when we say enough's enough. Stand with me if you would. Give me book of James, Brother Shannon, and I'll close it out. <laughs> and put us all out of our misery. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Verse number four, this is my thought. But let patience have her perfect work. What does that word perfect mean? Complete. Let the test finish. <laughs> 